Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit Inforum.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. Well, it might not be a dream house, but my guest room features my favorite childhood Barbies and other vintage favorites. Hi, this is Tracy Briggs, and welcome to a special edition of Back Then. Maybe this comes as no surprise to some of you, but the truth is, I'm a Barbie girl. There, I said it. Yeah, I consider myself a feminist and have been for years. I have vivid memories as a kid of singing along with friends to Helen Reddy's I Am Woman in my purple flower wallpaper shag carpeted bedroom. But gosh darn it, the Mattel maven maligned by so many feminists and some on the religious right, well, she just has my heart. This summer, many of you are joining me in a renewed love of all things Barbie, from new fashions, foods, makeup, and more. Thanks to the release of the highly anticipated Greta Gerwig movie starring Margot Robbie as Barbie and Ryan Gosling as Ken. I encourage you to go to YouTube and just look at some of the trailers of the movie. If you love Barbie like me, you're going to want to see the movie. And they even say if you hate Barbie, you're going to find some things to like about it. Basically, the concept is that Barbie and Ken are living in this Barbie world, which is pink and perfect and everything goes their way. But there's some sort of, Barbie is some sort of crisis and she ends up in the real world and she sees, you know, what life is like there. So great concept. I can't wait to see the movie. But as we were talking about this movie in our features department meeting at the forum, we pondered the idea of finding some kind of local angle to this highly anticipated movie. Our editor, Angie, said, maybe we should do a story with a super fan around here. Well, I looked inward and said, ah, that might be me. Now, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a super fan. I don't own thousands of dolls and I don't go to conventions, but I've turned the guest bedroom of our home into a Barbie room, packed full of my childhood Barbies, a few from my daughter's era, and a few vintage finds from thrift stores and antique stores. So maybe I could shed some light on why 58 million Barbies are sold every year. Why are grown-ups like me still entranced by her? And how did I get to the place where I'd even dedicate a room in my house to her? And why I believe she's been a feminist icon since she first stepped into the spotlight. All right, so let's go way, way back. Barbie was really the first toy I remember loving. I know there were others that came earlier, but nothing that had that impact on me that that little plastic woman did. I remember being about five or six and playing Barbies with my downstairs neighbor, Lisa. She pretended her Barbie was Jeannie from I Dream of Jeannie, and mine was Samantha from Bewitched. We made them neighbors, but... Because we only had one Ken doll between us, he had double duty as both Major Nelson and Darren Stevens. Another time, our imaginations turned our Barbies into Ginger and Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island. Clearly, we watched way too much after-school TV. I still remember getting live-action Barbie around 1972. Her arms and legs bent. You know, some of the older Barbies were um, stiff-legged, if you remember that. They, their elbows and knees didn't bend. Well, live-action Barbie did. And then when you, when you kind of shook her back and forth and had her dance, she jiggled. It was pretty crazy. She's dressed in a fringed hippie-like outfit. Now, she might have been three years late for Woodstock, but nonetheless, she was totally groovy. Then there was 1973's Quick Curl Barbie. She came with her own little plastic pink curling iron. You could tell as soon as you touched her hair that the reason it curled was because it was full of tiny little wires. So her hair flipped up like Marlo Thomas from That Girl, but could also double as a TV antenna. So win-win, right? And so it went like that for me in the early 70s. I'd get a doll and maybe some accessories every birthday and Christmas. I remember getting Barbie's high-rise townhouse on my birthday in 1972. I was so puzzled as to why my dad was more interested in watching the Nixon-McGovern election returns than playing with the coolest toy ever. I mean, come on. He probably didn't even realize it had an elevator. That maybe would have changed everything. 
Well, time marched on, and I grew out of my Barbies, but I never got rid of them. They were stuffed in old boxes and Rubbermaid containers and just thrown in the basement. Over the next few years, from the late 80s through the 1990s, I would cart them from my childhood home to apartment after apartment, never opening them, just not wanting to get rid of them. I eventually moved the boxes marked Tracy's Barbie stuff into my own home with my very accommodating new husband. I still couldn't get myself to get rid of these dolls. But by the late 1990s, Barbie would walk her little plastic high-heeled feet back into my life, thanks to my niece, Peyton. I clearly remember one Christmas when she was five or six, and she opened a Barbie someone had given her. I think I liked it as much as she did. I was just jealous. I don't want to be ungrateful, but that one stupid little Barbie seemed like a whole lot more fun than any of my grown-up presents. And I thought, why do kids get to have all the fun? So I decided nothing was stopping me from buying my own Barbies, even as a grown-up. But I didn't want the new ones. I wanted the ones I loved from my childhood, the vintage ones from the 60s and 70s, and maybe the occasional special release Barbie, you know, the ones from the movies like Barbie and My Fair Lady or Gone with the Wind, or maybe Barbie with Frank Sinatra or Elvis. There's a million of them. By the early 2000s, I was dabbling in collecting. Now, I never did it for the money. In fact, my collection isn't worth much, if anything at all. And in fact, I'm guessing that when I'm long gone, my kids will probably just throw the Barbies in the garbage. I'm not looking to make a profit. It's just for fun. So around this time, I still wasn't putting the dolls on display. My kids were little at the time, so any extra room in the house was allotted for their toys, from American Girl dolls to Polly Pockets. But as any mom could tell you, your kids grow up way too fast. Soon, my daughters were in their teens, and the toy room was obsolete. It was time to turn the toy room into a guest room. And this time, maybe mom's toys should fill the room. So that very accommodating husband of mine was nice enough to build some shelves for the room. And I set off to unpack the dolls I had not seen in years. Some were even still dressed in the homemade clothes my mom had made. She died in 1992, so it kind of brought a tear to my eye to see these little tiny dresses and jumpsuits and bell-bottom pants that she had made for me back in the 70s. The memories I thought were gone forever came rushing back. It was 1972 all over again, and I was playing with my friends and cousins and my sister. I placed the dolls on the shelves in as much of an order as I could muster. I finished the room with pink bedding and Barbie pillows I found online. I also hung up my kids' childhood art on the wall and, for good measure, put some of my mom's dolls from the 1940s in the room along with some dolls my daughters owned. I just love that room. But I know some people find it weird. One good friend said to me, Tracy, that's kind of creepy. Maybe she doesn't like little plastic eyes looking at her as she sleeps, so... Clearly, I just won't invite her over for any super cool Barbie sleepovers I have in that room. I am a little embarrassed sometimes to admit I've collected Barbies and have a room dedicated to her. America's number one doll has been criticized over the years for many things, including fostering poor body image in girls. And I do get that argument. And I applaud the fact that Mattel is now releasing several Barbies with more normal proportions. But I have to tell you, as a kid... I never looked at her body as aspirational. I looked at the life she led, or rather the life I had her lead, as aspirational. Our imaginations created entire Barbie towns, where Dr. Barbie would drive her Corvette home to her dream house after saving Skipper's life following some tragic run-in with G.I. Joe or Hungry Hungry Hippo. We were in charge, not only of what she wore, but who she was, what she did for a living, and how she lived her life. Mattel says Barbie has had more than 200 careers. She even became an astronaut and landed on the moon four years before Neil Armstrong did, and 18 years before Sally Ride became the first American woman in space. For me, as a girl growing up during the second wave of feminism, Barbie was more than just equal to Ken. Funny enough, on some Ken packaging, he's actually defined as accessory to Barbie, when my husband saw that, he, he joked that suddenly everything just made sense. 
I probably didn't realize it when I was seven, but Barbie was a tool for helping me envision my own limitless possibilities. I didn't become an astronaut or a brain surgeon, but as I write this and speak this, I have a TV journalist Barbie sitting on my desk. I make my living in part by using my imagination. So did Barbie help foster that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I just know today, even today, Barbie just makes me happy. And I hope Greta Gerwig's new movie will too. I'm sure I could be persuaded to make room for a Ryan Gosling Ken doll on those guest room shelves. Thanks for joining me on Back Then. I'm going to go now and get a ticket to the Barbie movie. I hope you do too. I hope you join me again next time. If you're loving this podcast, be sure to check out our full lineup. From news and local politics to sports and true crime, find your next great listen right now at inforum.com slash podcasts. That's inforum.com slash podcasts.